What's up, what's up, what's up, YouTube? I am back with another book review. I am sorry it's taken me so long to upload a video, but I have been going through it from everything to moving, to uh, computer drama, to uh, camera drama. I've had to get a new computer to do editing because it was too much for my last computer. Uh, I've had to get a new camera because the last one got stolen and then the one after that, the files kept getting corrupted. Um, this is actually my sixth time trying to record this video, which is super annoying and super intimidating because this is actually one of my longer book reviews, if not my longest one. And the reason why I, the book review ends up being so long is contextually, I think this is one of the most important books one can read uh, in the current paradigm that we are living in. Um, it, to, to explain on that further, uh, due to the past two and a half to three years and thanks to a certain unspecified virus of unknown origin. We have seen the rise of a new religion. This religion comes complete with all the hallmarks slash check marks of what should encapsulate a religion. For example, it has its own priests and prophets. This would be people like Anthony Fauci or Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan. You'll often see like atheist dorks in their room instead of having like a picture of Buddha, they'll have an altar to like Carl Sagan or something. You see this all the time. The, this religion comes with its own religious garb. You gotta wear your mask or you're unholy. You gotta wear your gloves and all this stuff or you're unholy. It comes with its own sacraments. Uh, instead of drinking wine at church, you get a new and that makes you all pure. But, you know, most bothering is it comes with its own religious mantras. You've probably heard it. The whole, trust the science, trust the experts, trust the science. It's, which, as soon as you hear something like that, a huge red flag should be going off in your head because science is not supposed to be trusted, it's supposed to be tested. Trusting the science is the most unscientific thing you can do. So, how, what we're gonna do is I'll give you a little context as to the author and then we'll get into the actual meat of the book. So, this book is The Science Delusion, also known as Science Set Free. As the, the current edition is called Science Set Free and it won uh, science book of the year by the scientific and medical network. Um, so it's right off the bat though, this book may seemingly be, uh, sound like it's an unscientific text. It's actually written by an extremely accomplished, a really well-known scientist. And how I got into Rupert Sheldrake actually was through Terrence McKenna lectures. See back in the day before there were podcasts, if there's something you really liked, you just listen to all their lectures. You download them and just listen to them on your iTunes or whatever. Sometimes you'd see their lectures on YouTube. And I'd watch a lot of Terrence McKenna lectures. He'd often be doing work with uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who, now YouTube correct comments correct me if I'm wrong, but R R Rupert Sheldrake is known for bringing the idea of morphic resonance to the table. Uh, he has his morphic resonance theory, which, as I said, correct me if I'm wrong here, YouTube comments, but the general idea of it is that uh, energy pre-exists pre -exists the form that fills it up. So that, um, you know, for example, every uh, organism, every human being has their physical body, but then there's this kind of morphic energetic field, toroidic field that emanates from around them that goes beyond their physical body and your physical body fills into that form, but even then the, the energetic body expands beyond it. And this uh, morphic resonance field, so to say, um, it, it's every organism has, has this field and it's the intersecting of all these fields that give us common consensus reality. But in addition, this, uh, this idea properly ex or adequately explains high strangest phenomena, like the feeling of being stared at by someone, even though you're not looking at them. It could be the intersecting of fields that kind of give that little click that up, oh, I'm being watched. So um, he was known for coining that and, um, you know, I'll tell you a little bit more about him. Uh, in the preface, he gives a little, uh, uh, little explanation of to who he is. Um, so, for the, on page four. 
For the last 28 years, I've been a fellow of the Institute of Noetic Sciences near San Francisco and a visiting professor at several universities, including the Graduate Institute in Connecticut. I publish more than 90 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including several in Nature. I belong to a range of scientific societies, including the Society for Experimental Biology and Society for Scientific Exploration. And I'm a fellow at the Zoological Society, Society and the Cambridge Philosophical Society. I give seminars and lectures on my research at a wide variety of universities, research institutes, and scientific conferences in Britain, continental Europe, North and South America, India, and Australia. So this guy's got the scientific backing and the scientific credentials. So how the, how the book works in itself is Rupert Sheldrake will go over uh, 11 dogmas that the modern scientific community holds as fact, despite not having adequate proof or scientific backing to make these claims. Uh, along these dogmas would be something like, are the laws of nature fixed or are they something else? Are they habits? Uh, we don't know that the laws of nature are fixed. In fact, there's been plenty of evidence to show that what we see as an immutable law can actually be shifted and changed depending on the context. So um, we'll get into that. And uh, so how it's going to go is I'm going to go over these dogmas and you'll see at the end of every chapter, uh, Rupert Sheldrake includes questions for materialists and then a summary of the chapter. Now within the chapter, like before you get to the summary, it'll be full of scientific research to help you uh, question the dogma. And then you just, uh, then in the summary, he'll just briefly go over that research and just kind of encapsulate it. So without further ado, let's get into these 10 dogmas and, or 11 dogmas, and just um, take it from there. But you know, in the little pro uh, prologue, um, it gives a little background here. So, some scientists and intellectuals are deeply committed atheists, and the materialist philosophy is central to their belief system. A, mi a minority become missionaries filled with evangelical zeal. They see themselves as old-style crusaders fighting for science and reason against the force of superstition, religion, and credulity. Ideally, science is a process, not a position or a belief system. So keep that in mind, because that's kind of encapsulates like the general ethos of what this book is about. So the first dogma is, is nature mechanical? And, you know, here are some of the questions for materialists. Do you think that you yourself are nothing but a complex machine? Have you been programmed to believe in materialism? The summary, the mechanistic theory is based on the metaphor of the machine, but is only a metaphor. Living organisms provide better metaphors for organized systems at all levels of complexity, including molecules, plants, and societies of animals, all of which are organized in a series of inclusive levels in which the whole at each level is more than the sum of its parts, which are themselves holes at, at a lower level. Even the most ardent defenders of the mechanistic theory smuggle in purposive organizing principles into living organisms in the form of selfish genes or genetic programs. In the light of the Big Bang Theory, the entire universe is more like a growing, developing organism than a machine slowly running out of steam. The next dogma is, is the total amount of matter and energy always the same? So this chapter gets into a lot of uh, the concept of dark matter a lot, uh, right here off the bat. Dark matter is currently thought to make up about 27% of the mass and energy of the universe, whereas normal matter and energy make up only about 5%. So, you know, it's kind of talks about this idea that we have this model of the universe and in it, it only adequately explains about 5%. And anything that doesn't fit into that model is thrown in the section of dark matter, which is to be ignored so we can explain the rest of this. So rather than sticking with an outdated model that doesn't adequately explain at least 95% of the universe, it's time to maybe change our models up so that we can have a more holistic system of understanding. Um, you know, and we'll go into that. Um, I got here, right here, on uh, page 67, a Terence McKenna quote. As Terence McKenna expressed it, what orthodoxy teaches about time is that the universe sprang from utter nothingness in a single moment. It's almost as if science said, give me one free miracle, and from there the entire thing will proceed with a seamless causal explanation. The one free miracle was the sudden appearance of all matter and energy in the universe with all laws that govern it. And we will um, get, oh yeah, right here. Um, there's another one. Exploding stars in faraway galaxies showed that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. Gravitation ought to be slowing down. So something else must account for accelerating growth. And let's get to the summary. In the Big Bang, all matter and energy in the universe suddenly appeared from nowhere. Modern cosmology supposes that dark matter and energy now make up 95% of reality. No one knows what dark matter and energy are, 
how they work or how they interact with familiar forms of matter and energy. The amount of dark energy seems to be increasing as the universe expands and the quintessence field may give rise to new matter and energy, more in some places than others. The evidence for energy conservation in living organisms is weak, and there are several anomalies, like the apparent ability of some people to live without food for long periods. That's just the existence of new forms of energy. All quantum processes are supposed to be mediated through a quantum vacuum field, also known as a zero-point field, which is not empty but full of energy and continually gives rise to virtual photons and particles of matter. Could this energy be tapped into new technologies? Um, the next uh, dogma, which is actually one of my favorite ones I briefly mentioned, is are the laws of nature fixed? And here's what I have highlighted. The laws of nature were eternal ideas in the mind of a mathematical god. But for materialists, there is no god and no transcendent mind in which these laws can be sustained. So where are they? And why do they still share the traditional attributes of God? Why are they universal, immutable, omnipotent, and why do they transcend space and time? I suggest an alternative to, uh, alternative to eternal laws, evolving habits. I think that's a really cool concept, um, habits of nature or habits of physics rather than laws of physics. Uh, later, it gets into, in this chapter, it starts talking about the habits of crystallization. The hypothesis of morphic resonance predicts that when chemists make a new com compound for the first time, it might be difficult to obtain crystals of this compound. A morphic field for this crystal form does not yet exist. When the crystals appear for the first time, a new pattern of organization comes into being. The second time the compound crystallizes, there will be an influence from the first crystals by morphic resonance all over the world. The third time, there will be an influence from the first and second crystals and so on. This influence builds up cumulatively. A new habit develops. The more com a compound crystallizes, the more easily its crystals should form. Uh, and then um, we will get into, uh, the, we'll read the summary, and then I gotta answer a quick phone call. Um, well, here, questions for materials. What is wrong with the idea that nature has habits rather than laws? I mean, we're humans, we have habits, but maybe the rest of nature has habits too. How do you know that the laws of nature are fixed and not evolutionary? And here's the summary. The idea that the laws of nature are fixed while the universe evolves is an assumption left over from pre-evolutionary cosmology. The laws themselves may evolve, or rather be more like habits. Also, the fundamental concepts may be variable, and their values may not have been fixed at the time of the instant of the Big Bang. They still seem to be varying today. There may be inherent memory in nature. All organisms may, organisms may participate in collective memory of their kind. Crystals may crystallize the way they do because they are formed that way before. The more crystals of a particular chemical rise in one place, the easier they should crystallize everywhere else on Earth, and maybe throughout the universe. Evolution may be the result of interplay between habits and creativity. New forms and patterns of organization appear spontaneously and are subject to natural selection. Those that survive are more likely to appear again as new habits and build up, and through repetition they become increasingly habitual. The next dogma we get into is, is matter unconscious? And I don't have much highlighted from this chapter, but there are some interesting questions at the end, such as, if consciousness does nothing, why has it evolved as an evolutionary adaption? Is your own belief in materialism determined by unconscious process in your brain rather than reason, evidence, and choice? The summary. In the mechanistic science of the 17th century, matter was defined as unconscious, and conscious minds were confined to human beings along with spirit and angels of God. There was a duality of spirit and matter. No one could satisfactorily explain how non-physical minds could interact with material brains and materialists reject the existence of these mysterious immaterial entities, leaving only unconscious matter. But since we ourselves are conscious, this elimination of mind created a big problem for materialists who have tried to explain human consciousness away or dismiss it as illusory. But instead of assuming that materialism and dual dualism are the only options, some philosophers have explored the idea that all self-organizing material systems have a mental as well as, a, as well as physical aspect. Their minds relate to them future goals and are shaped by memories of their path, both individual and collective. Their relationship of minds to bodies is more to do with time than space. Minds choose among possible futures and mental causations run in opposite directions from energetic causation, from virtual futures towards the past rather than from past towards the future and uh you know this is also like a, a super potent dogma for me to address simply because i just came back from japan and the and japan awesome by the way videos to come hopefully but like what i learned in japan is a lot about the the core indigenous spirituality that runs through the japan it's known as shinto and ascension though well, i don't know if i said it right but and essentially the 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 core belief of that uh system is that uh everything has spirit it's animism for lack of better words everything has spirit i have spirit this desk that camera the people watching it and so on and everything has a in some form or another is alive 
And you can really see this mentality and ethos and how it affects uh, Japan, specifically when it comes to, off the top of my head, the architecture. You know, you'll go to these giant gardens with some pagodas and stuff, and nothing feels like it's intrusive in the setting at large. Like if they're going to build a shrine, it's as if they're going into, into in the woods, it's as if they're going into someone's house. And instead of building a completely new house that doesn't fit with the background, they'll build something that harmonic, harmonically, uh, harmoniously kind of just blends into the background as if it was already there, like it's a part of the, the, the forest overall. And they have such an attention to detail and color and placement that uh, it really gave me, I already respected Japan, but it gave me, and Rishinto, but it gave me so much more respect for um, the behaviors that, and uh, mentality that comes with uh, integrating those beliefs. So the next dogma that they address is nature purposeless. And you saw in the question for materialists, um, if consciousness does nothing, why is it evolved as an evolutionary adaption? So when is nature purposeless? I always like asking this question to materialists and atheists because, you know, atheists always got to have an explanation for everything. And even if they're talking out of their ass, so you can ask them, you know, uh, start small, like what is the purpose of this moss? And they'll be like, oh, it's to feed this. It's to provide nutrients for that. It's to uh, 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 help out the ecological system in this way. Okay, what's the purpose of bees? Oh, it's to pollinate stuff, it's to do this, that. All right, then what's the purpose of humans? They always shoot blanks. I'm like, what's the purpose of human consciousness? They always shoot blanks because consciousness is kind of one of those things that don't fit into the materialist paradigm and the magic that comes with uh, consciousness. So they always try to like avoid that subject altogether. But yeah, so is nature purposeless? Um, and let's see if I have anything highlighted from this chapter. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, doo -doo. Doesn't look like it. So we'll go right to uh, the summary. And as I said, like be with before the summary of, at the end of every chapter, the rest of the, the whole chapter is usually about scientific research that will, uh, you know, fill in the, the questions that this dogma asks and help you see in a different light. So here's the summary. Self-organizing systems have their own ends, goals, and attractors towards which they move. All living organisms show goal-directed development and behavior. Developing plants and animals are attracted towards development ends, and their, if their development is distributed, disrupted, they can often reach the same end by a different pathway. Animal behavior is directed towards the ends as consummatory acts. In physics, goal-directed behavior is modeled in terms of attractors, as if the future ends had an influence working backwards in time. And several quantum theorists have proposed that causal influences may move from the future towards the past, as well as from the past towards the future. Chemical processes like protein folding also seem to be directed towards attractors or ends. End directed behavior is usually unconscious, even in humans. Most purposes and goals are habitual. Consciousness pro pro proposes that the, the consciousness proposes are except are the exception rather than the rule. Both evolution and progress can be interpreted in terms of attractors, with influences working backwards in time from future goals. Uh, the next dogma is is all biological inheritance material. Uh, this gets into some interesting stuff, um, specifically epigenetic memory, um, and I'll explain that. Um, so, uh, I think right here I have highlights. Okay, yeah. Epigenetics and the inheritance of acquired characteristics. One of the biggest controversies in 20th century biology concerned the inheritance of acquired characteristics, namely the ability of animals and plants to inherit adaptions acquired by their ancestors. For example, if a bodybuilder acquired enormous muscles, his children would tend to have larger muscles as well. The taboo against the inheritance of acquired characteristics began to dissolve around the turn of millennium. There is a growing recognition that some acquired characteristics can indeed be inherited. This, is the, this kind of inheritance is now called epigenetic inheritance. And I don't have the whole context of this study uh, highlighted, but it kind of gives the idea where uh, the mothers never met the fathers, yet the children and grandchildren still inherited the effect of their father's fear. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, and then, yeah. You know, the difference between the materialist theory, like, so this kind of is a good uh, encapsulation of what this chapter talks about, and honestly, the book at large. But the difference between the materialist theory and the morphic resonance hypothesis can be illustrated by analogy with a television set. The pictures on the screen depend on the, materials compo the material components of the set and the energy that powers it, and also on the invisible transmission it receives through the electromagnetic field. A skeptic who rejected the idea of invisible influences might try to explain everything about the pictures and sound in terms of components of the set, the wires, transistors, and so on. 
and the electrical interactions between them. Through careful research, you would find that damaging or removing some of these components affected the pictures or sound that the set produced and did so in a repeatable, predictable way. This discovery would reinforce his materialist belief. He would be unable to explain exactly how the set produced the pictures and sounds, but he would hope that with a more detailed analysis of the components and the more complex mathematical models of their interaction, he would eventually be provided the answer. And let's go over the summary. Um, genes are overrated in the sense that they do not code for or program the form of behavior of organisms. They specify a sequence of amino acids and protein molecules and are involved in the control of protein synthesis. The Human Genome Project and other genome projects have been disappointing both scientifically and financially because they are based on the false conception of what genes do. The inheritance of development and behavior may be, depend on organizing fields that have an inherent memory. In addition, characters acquired by plants and animals can be passed to their descendants epigenetically through modification of gene expression rather than mutation. Habits of growth and behavior can be inherited through a collective memory of of the species on which each individual draws into which it contributes. Organisms inherent habits organisms inherit habits of form and behavior and are not coded to the genes by the process of morphic resonance. Morphic resonance may also underlie cultural inheritance, which, di which differ in degree, but not in kind, from the inheritance from the inheritance of forms and instincts. A new understanding of evolution is evolving. Um, the next one is the next dogma is our memories stored as material traces. Um, this one's actually super interesting as well because it gets into the idea that uh, memory is perhaps channeled rather than it is like stored in a hard part of your brain. Um, uh, one of the research it goes over is about worms. It goes like the worms soon regenerated new heads and when they had done so, they remembered what they had learned. So pretty interesting stuff. Obviously it talks about humans too and not just worms. The alternative is the alternative is the resonance theory. The memories are transferred by resonance from similar patterns of activity in the past. We tune into ourselves in the past. We do not carry our memories around inside our heads. Um, we'll go to the summary. Uh, I mean, it'll test some of the questions. Have you ever considered the possibility that memory de might depend on some kind of resonance other than material traces? If trace theory of memory is a testable hypothesis rather than a dogma, how could it be established experimentally that memory depends on traces rather than resonance? Now we'll read the summary. The conventional materialist assumption is that memories are stored in physical traces within the brain. Repeated failures to find memory traces fit well with the idea of memory as a resonant phenomena, where similar patterns of activity in the past affect present activities in the mind and brain. The individual and collective memory may both depend on resonance, but self-resonance from the individual's own past is more specific and hence more effective. Animal and human learning may be transmitted by morphic resonance across space and time. The resonance theory helped account for the ability of memories to survive serious damage to the brain and is consistent with all basic five basic kinds of remembering. This theory predicts that if animals, let's say rats, learn a new trick in one place, say harm, rats all over the world should be able to learn it faster thereafter. There's already evidence for this actually happening. Similar principles apply to human learning. For example, if millions of people take standardized tests like IQ tests, the test should become progressively easier on average for other people to do. Again, this seems to be what happens. Individual memory and collective memory may be different aspects of the same phenomena that differ in different degrees. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of research of like people getting brain damage or part of their brain removed and still can remember everything as a whole. And so that always kind of throws a wrench in the memory stored as material traces theory. Um, the next dogma is our minds confined to the brains. So here's some of what I have highlighted. We need not stay stuck in the materialist dualist contradiction. There's a way out, a field theory of minds. We're used to the fact that the field exists both within and outside the material objects. The field of a magnet is inside it and also extends beyond the surface. The gravitational field of Earth is inside the Earth and also stretches out far beyond it, keeping the, keeping the moon in its orbit. The electromagnetic field of a mobile phone is both inside it and extends all around it. In this chapter, I suggest the field of minds are within the brains and extend beyond them. Um, and it goes like, you know, where is the extraordinary evidence for the materialist claim that mind is nothing but the activity of the brain? Um, and uh, yeah, this is one of the really mo interesting research uh, 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 reach studies done that this uh, chapter goes over is regarding being stared at, realizing you're being stared at through a CCTV camera. So it says, the fact that gaze detection work through CCTV shows that people can detect other people's attention even when they are not being watched directly. So think about the implications of that. Like, let's say you're in a mall and 
there's cameras everywhere and a security guard is on the other side of those cameras. Let's say he's just chilling out, eating donuts, not paying attention. But when he starts to pay attention, let's say you're walking by a camera and he looks up and starts staring at you through the camera, you, as the person being observed, might get a click and notice that you're being watched at that moment through the camera. Meaning, gaze detection works through, through a medium. And, you know, the spiritual and other implications of that are pretty fascinating. Like, will I be able to feel you guys when you're watching me through a YouTube video? Does a Hollywood celebrity get, have this constant feeling of always being watched? Or maybe it's some sort of potent energy surging through them whenever people are watching their movies? It's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, we'll go over the summary here. Or actually, let's uh, go for the questions for materials. When you look at the sky, do you think the sky you are seeing is inside your skull and is and that's, that, that your skull is beyond the sky? Have you ever felt someone that was looking at you from behind or have you ever made someone turn by staring at them? Um, summary. Our minds extended in our minds are extended very in every act of perception, reaching even as far as the stars. Vision involves a two-way process: the inward movement of light into the eyes and the outward projection of images. What we see around us in our minds is in our minds, but not in our brains. When we look at something, in a sense, our mind touches it. This may help to explain the sense of being stared at. Most people say they have felt someone looking at them from behind and claim to have made people turn around by looking at them. The ability to detect stares seems to be real as shown in many scientific tests and even seems to work through a closed circuit television. Minds are extended beyond the brain, not only in space, but also in time and connect us to our own past through memory and to virtual futures among which we choose. Now, this next one, uh, is pretty fascinating and is one of my favorites. Um, and is uh, the dogma, are psychic phenomena illusory? Illusory? I always have trouble with this word, illusory. I'll say it that way. Um, and obviously I'm really into this subject, but uh, let's see what we have hi highlighted here. Skeptics often repeat the slogan, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence, which is another expression of the materialist assumption. The sense of being stared at and telepathy are ordinary in that most people have experienced them. They are not extraordinary, meaning beyond the normal order, or highly exceptional. They are common. From this point of view, the skeptic's claim is extraordinary and demands extraordinary evidence. Where is the extraordinary evidence that most people are deluded about their own experience? Skeptics can only fall back on generic argument about fallibility of human judgment, or rather, other people's judgment. Never theirs, just others. Um, and it gets into a lot of research on dreams and pre precognition um, within this chapter. A lot of fascinating research on that. I highly recommend looking it up. I uh, guess into research. Um, by guessing at random, subjects would have been right about one time in four, 25%. In fact, the average hit rate was about 45%, very significantly above the chance level. So it gets into like psychic research like that. There's a whole body of work. I recommend looking uh, looking up the YouTube channel, Thinking Aloud of Jeffrey Mishlov. It's all about this stuff. Uh, dude's a doctor from Duke and has been studying paranormal phenomena his whole life. He's interviewed Terrence McKenna, Michael Talbot, uh, Ram Das, and everyone in between. Um, you know, and it also talks about how the phenomena of side, though it's perceived as unscientific, a lot of scientists are actually into the idea. Actual data from surveys of scientists show a very different picture. For example, in a survey of 1,100 college professors in the United States, 55% of natural scientists said they believed that psi was an established fact or likely possibility. So let's uh, get into the summary. Well, yeah, questions keep doing this. I go, summary, but let me tell you some questions. Have you yourself ever had a seemingly telepathic experience? Have you ever looked into, at the evidence of psychic phenomena? If so, can you summarize it and explain what is wrong with it? If you think telepathy and precognition are theoretically impossible or very improbable, can you explain why? Now we'll read the summary. Dogmatic skeptics reject all the evidence for psychic phenomena because it conflicts with their materialist worldview. Even so, most people claim to have had telepathic experiences. Numerous statistical experiments have shown that information can be transmitted from one person to a person in a way that cannot be explained in terms of normal senses. Telepathy typically happens between people who are closely bonded, like mothers and children, spouses, or close friends. 
Many nursing mothers seem to be able to detect when their babies are in distress when they are miles away. The commonest kind of telepathy in the modern world occurs in connection with telephone calls and when people think of someone and the phone rings or they know who just who's calling. Numerous experimental tests have shown that this is a real phenomenon. It does not fall off with distance. Social animals seem to be able to keep in touch with members of their group at a distance telepathically and domesticated an animals like dogs and cats and horses and parrots often pick up their owners emotions and tensions at the distance as shown in experiments with dogs and parrots. Other psychic ability includes premonitions and precognitions as shown by animals in anticipation of earthquakes, tsunamis, and other disasters. Human premonition usually occurs in dreams or through intuitions. In experimental research on human present, presented, presentiments, future emotional events seem to be able to work backwards in time to produce de detectable, detectable physiological effects. The next one is, the next dogma is, is mechanistic medicine the only kind that really works? Obviously, once again, a very potent subject for people living in this current paradigm. Uh, we're taught to believe, at least in the West, that only Western medicine exists. But if you look into the history of Western medicine, specifically the American Medical Association, you'll find it is littered with corruption. For example, it was started by the Rockefellers, you know, the petroleum empire. Uh, yeah, those shady guys. Yeah, they started the AMA. And what does the AMA do? Uh, they actively harass, uh, discredit, and, uh, and push away any medical healing paradigm that does not fit into Western medicine. Things like acupuncture, for example, which we all know that works. And uh, herbal medicine, which we all know that works. Psychedelics, which we all know works. It actively tries to destroy these things so that only medicine that the Rockefellers can make a profit off of gets pushed in the public lexicon, specifically petroleum-based medicine. Um, some things I have highlighted here uh, would be, if this summarize it. If materialism were an adequate foundation for medicine, placebo responses ought not to occur. Think about that. Um, other studies show that more people who kept pets survived after heart attacks than those without. And elderly and brave people who kept dogs or cats had better health and needed less medication than those who did not have animals to keep them company. Numerous studies in the United States and elsewhere have shown that people who are religious, especially those who regularly attend religious services, live significantly longer and have better health and less depression than people without religious faith. Uh, let's go to the summary. No, oh, question. How would you explain the placebo response? And that's the only question I'm gonna read from there because it's a good one. <laughs> Summary, modern medicine has been amazingly successful. Together with immunization programs and public health measures, it has reduced infant mortality, transformed human lives, and increased life expectancy. It focuses on the physical and chemical aspects of the human bodies. Its focus on the physical and chemical aspects of human bodies has resulted in major advances in surgery and drugs. But because of this, its material, materialist prejudices, it ignores mental influences as much as possible. People's hopes and expectations affect their recovery from disease, injury, or surgery as revealed in quantitatively, as revealed quantitatively in placebo responses. The power of belief is also shown by hypnotic induction uh, of blisters and by magical cures for warts. Conversely, feeling of despair and hopelessness can suppress the activity of the immune system, leading to poor rates of recovery from injury and surgery. People who have suffered from heart attacks survive better on average if they're married or have a close friend or keep a pet. Regular attendance at religious services tends to lead to better health and longevity, and people who pray or meditate tend to be healthier and live longer than those who do not. Thus, many psychological, emotional, and social, and thus, many psychological, emotional, social, and spiritual factors affect, the health, affect health and disease. So do diet and lifestyle. The obesity pandemic and the spiraling cost of healthcare are forcing changes in government policies, but exhaustion and education are of limited effectiveness in changing people's motivation and behavior. Alternative and complementary systems of medicine cure some people some of the time, and not all of their effects can be ascribed to placebo responses alone. Comparative effectiveness research provides a way of finding what, out what works best. All medical systems involve placebo responses, and some procedures more than others, and some produce more than others. When people are nearing death, Heroic attempts to keep them alive by emergency surgical intervention are expensive and often inappropriate. They're, if give, they're given the choice, many prefer palliative care and prefer hospice to, a, at a, hospice to a hospital, even if they are likely to die sooner. An inclusive, integrative medical system is likely to be cheaper, more effective than an exclusively me mechanistic system. The last dogma that we list is the illusions of objectivity. Now, this is a super potent uh, uh, chapter. And it means a lot to me because it gets into um, 
I mean, for lack of better words, it gets into the difference between um, the modern scientist, science uh, paradigm and alchemy. Now, many people don't know this, but, uh, you know, let me go on a side, a little tangent for a second. But um, Egypt is not the actual name of that land. It's actually a relatively new name that's come forth uh, in the last 150 years or so. The name of that land is Kemet, also known as Al Kem, right? And the science, there, the science that they were known to do there was referred to as alchemy. Yes, it comes from a real place, it's a real term. Uh, what is alchemy and what's the difference between that and modern science? Alchemy, there's no separation between the observer and the experiment, whereas modern science hides under this false veil of objectivity. Now, to expand on that, if you were to write a, a research paper for a scientific journal, uh, let's say I was looking through a microscope and I made a new discovery. If I was listening at a scientific journal, I would write down the type of microscope that was used and the conditions I was using it in. That way, someone reading this journal can replicate that, the, the findings in their own space, knowing the equipment I used. The thing is, what modern science fails to uh, integrate is that we, the human doing the experiment, are the telescope, are the microscope. We are an instrument of the observation. Uh, so there is no objectivity. You, the experimenter affects the outcome. And the idea of objectivity is potentially just a lie that's guiding us down a bad path. Um, in the 19th century, mechanist, materialists believed that physics was able to give a clear definition of matter, leaving minds out of the picture altogether. But with development of quantum theory from the 1920s, this assumption has become untenable. untenable. Observations require observers, and the way in which experiments are done affects the results they give. Uh, later, it will get into um, this really fascinating study. Uh, the determination of the fundamental constant in a case is a case in point. When the speed of light C apparently dropped 20 kilometers per second from 1928 to 1945, laboratories all around the world reported measurements close to the consensus value. But when C went up again, laboratories duly agreed closely with the new consensus. Did the speed of light really change? The data says it did, but for theoretical reasons, it could not really have changed because it is believed to be a fundamental constant. Um, later, it gets into the harm of uh, passive voice in journals rather than active voice. So uh, uh, an active voice would be, I then picked up the book. A passive voice would be, a book was then picked up and placed appropriately, removing the human from that experiment, which is just a flawed way of thinking. It gets into the Royal Society. When, when Lord May, the president of the Royal Society, read the results of my survey of school science teaching, wait, read the results of my survey of school science teaching, he was horrified that so many favored the passive. He said, I would put my own view so strongly as to say that these days the use of passive voice in a research paper is a hallmark of second rate work. Uh, later, it gets into. Uh, uh, the idea that scientific journals aren't as invaluable as one may think. In 2016, Na Nature carried out a survey of more than 1,500 researchers in a wide, wide range of fields of science and found that over 70% had failed to reproduce other scientists' results. Over 70%. And that's the most prestigious journal in the world, arguably. All right. So there is no trusting the science. There's only testing it. All too often, the goal of skepticism is not the discovery of truth, but the exposure of other people's errors. And we see this too much of people branded as, that brand themselves as skeptics. No, there's nothing wrong with being skeptical. We should all be skeptical. But I've often found that people whose whole identity is being a skeptic are just very bitter, angry people. And they don't have any ideas of their own. They exist simply to tear down other people's ideas. A uh, perfect example of this is when Michael Shermer and Graham Hancock were on Rogan's podcast. And... Um, uh, Graham Hancock had, was talking about Gobecki Tep, Go Tepley and how, you know, it's fascinating. It's X many years old. Has all... Michael Shermer was denying the existence of this place before he even knew it, it, it existed. Like, he, Graham Hancock was the one that introduced him to this place. Like, oh, no, that's not real. That's not real. I'm like, well, do you know anything about this place? And he's like, nah. He's like, okay. Like, that's the skeptic mentality in a nutshell, if you ask me. Um, and it just, like, it's bitter and it's a loser mentality. Not saying being a skeptic, not being saying being skeptical is a loser mentality, but marketing yourself as a ske pure skeptic, that's a loser mentality. And um, history doesn't remember the skeptics. It doesn't remember the people that said no to Nikola Tesla, except maybe Edison. 
But it's not that he said no, he's trying to cover that up. But it doesn't remember all the naysayers, it remembers the guy that actually brought something to the table. So, here are the questions for that. Um, experimentals, experiments, expectations are known to affect the results of research in psychology, parapsychology, and medicine, which is why researchers often use blind method methodologies. Do you think that experimenter, may, experimenter effects may play a role in other fields of science too? Um, how do you think scientists should deal with ideologically, politically, or commercially motivated skepticism? And the summary is as follows. Scientists are often imagined to achieve superhuman levels of objectivity. This is believed to be sustained by the ideal of a disembodied knowledge, unaffected by ambitions, hopes, fears, and other emotions. In the allegory of the cave, scientists venture forth into the light, ob light of objective truth and bring back their discoveries for the benefit of ordinary people trapped in the world of opinion, self-interest, and illusion. By writing in a passive voice, a test tube was taken rather than an active voice. I took, the I took a test tube. Scientists tried to emphasize their objectivity, but many have now abandoned this pretense. Scientists are, of course, people, and people are subject to the limitations of personality, politics, peer group pressure, fashion, and the need for funding. Within medicine, psychology, and parapsychology, most researchers recognize that their expectations can bias their results, which is why they often use blind or double-blind methodologies. In the so-called hard scientists, most researchers assume that blind methods are unnecessary. Scientific careers are now determined primarily by the number of papers published in scientific journals and the impact of journals in which they are published. This gives scientists, their institutions, and the journals themselves a strong incentive to publish po positive findings. In most fields of science, research, researchers publish only a small portion, proportion of their data, giving plenty of scope for the selective presentation of results. And the scientific journals introduce a further source of bias through their unwillingness to publish negative findings or replications of previous studies. Many journals are now owned by international corporations whose primary motive is profit. Fraud and deceit in, in science are rarely detected by the peer review system and usually come to light as a result of whistleblowing. Since around 2015, it has become clear that findings and reports reported in most papers in scientific journals cannot be replicated, giving the rise to a repro reproductibility crisis. Skepticism is a healthy part of normal science, but is often used as a weapon of defense or politically or ideologically motivated points of view or to save off the regulation of toxic chemicals. The separation of facts and values is usually impossible in practice, and many scientists exaggerate the value of their research in order to get funded. Although objectivity of science is a noble ideal, there is more hope for achieving it by recognizing the humanity of science, scientists and their limitation, rather than by pretending that science has a unique access to truth. So those are the 11 dogmas in a nutshell, um, and all of them are just so uh, thought-provoking and may really question uh, one's own dogmas when going into research. Even even now, like, you'll see the, the so many things that can't actually be proven by you yourself are taken as dogmatic fact. A perfect example of this is geocentricism versus heliocentricism. You know, you'll always see, you know, flat earthers being mocked or laughed at and whatever, that's fine in itself. Um, not really, but you know, it, it happens. But uh, you know, not even Stephen Hawking, nor Einstein, nor Ed Edwin Hubble could disprove geocentricity. In fact, both Stephen Hawking and Edwin Hubble said they prefer heliocentric heliocentric heliocentricity based on philosophical grounds. Uh, Stephen Hawking said the idea of the thought of being at the center of the universe is really disturbing, so he chooses to go with the uh, heliocentric model. So even these things that we, we take as fact may not exactly be fact, and it's just a matter of getting beneath the dogma to help you maybe get a broader understanding of things as a whole. Um, as I said, I think this book is absolutely fantastic. I think it is the cure to the rising religion of scientism, the trust the science dorks and whatnot. And I could not have uh, read a better book. I hope this book review wasn't too long. I hope it was helpful. Sorry it's taken me so long, but thank you for bearing with me and staying with me. Uh, six takes in. Let's hope this is the one that sticks. Thank you so much for your time. Arigatou gozaimasu. All right, I'll catch you all later.